7.30 p.m. Telly Edwards on News 5 tonight, HDB resale prices rise by the smallest amount in years, while private home prices post the first fall since 2009. They have reached resistance levels. We expect prices to be stable uh, in the next quarter. This will be the beginning of a new era. Aung San Suu Kyi calls for political unity as her party claims a near clean sweep in by-elections. It appears to be a transparent process. ASEAN welcomes the conduct of the polls and calls for sanctions to be lifted. And Singapore's first Olympic size skating rink is now open. First tonight, prices of HDB resale flats were nearly flat in the first three months of this year, inching up a mere 0.6%. The flash estimate released by the Housing Board today is less than half the growth seen in the previous quarter. Analysts say this indicates that prices are stabilising. It was a quieter first quarter for the HDB resale market, with fewer flats changing hands. Property firms say the cash premium paid up front, also known as cash overvaluation or COV, has been declining. Propnext says its median COV was $25,000, down from $32,000 in the fourth quarter of last year, while ERA's median COV dropped 18% to hit $27,000 in Q1. HDB resale prices are now at an all-time high and you find that uh, uh, in many instances they have reached resistance levels. Uh, buyers are not willing to pay uh, for the higher prices. Market watchers say the large number of new flats offered by the government, some 50,000 units within these two years, has drawn much demand away from the resale market. And with new flats being launched in more towns, including mature estates, home buyers now have more choices to choose from. Property watchers expect the trend of slow price growth or even zero growth to continue for the rest of the year. While the stagnating prices will be a relief to home buyers, those hoping to upgrade to private property may find it more expensive. We have already seen that HDB resale flat prices are growing at 0.6%, but the price of mass market condominium are growing at a faster rate at 1.2% uh, for the first quarter. If this trend were to continue, what we could see is that um, the dreams of upgrading to a private uh, condominium for many HDB upgraders may be gradually uh, going out of reach because the prices of H uh, the mass market condominiums are rising at a faster rate. The flash estimates are based on figures from the first 10 weeks of the quarter. Full results will be released at the end of this month. Meantime, private home prices fell 0.1% in the first quarter, according to estimates from the Urban Redevelopment Authority. That's the first decline in two and a half years, and analysts put it down to slower sales in the luxury and resale segment. Private home prices declined across all segments in the first quarter. In the core central region, prices fell by 0.9%, while those in city fringe fell by 0.7%. But there was one exception. Prices of homes in suburban areas rose by 1.2%. The mass market rise, we expect prices to be stable uh, in the next quarter, in the second quarter of 2012. Whereas for the so-called mid-tier and also the luxury market, people are actually holding back from their purchases. Experts say mass market home prices may soften in the quarters ahead as a result of less aggressive bidding for sites. The total number of bids for government land sales would still be 5 to 10 or maybe even 12 bidders per land tender. Um, but you see that the prices now are sort of bunching up closer and they are not setting new records like they were last year for government land sales, especially in the outskirts of Singapore. Buyers are now very much uh, more resistant to um, further price hikes now that prices are at an all-time high. So this could probably limit the potential in price increases. Going forward, analysts expect private property prices to fall by 5% by year-end. Still, experts say it's still too early to judge if the additional buyer stem duty introduced by the government in December has been effective in curbing price increases. But they do not expect more cooling measures in the near term.
The flash estimates are based on caveats lodged in the first 10 weeks of Q1 2012. And the URA has cautioned that the actual price index, which will be out in four weeks, may differ significantly from the latest flash estimates. Linda Hong, Channel News Asia, Singapore. Myanmar's opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi is calling for political unity after her party claimed a major victory in yesterday's landmark by-elections. The National League for Democracy says it has won at least 43 of the 44 seats it contested. Official results are expected within a week. But Ms Suu Kyi is expected to take public office for the first time and head a small opposition bloc in parliament. She has urged her supporters to show restraint in their celebrations, saying the priority now is reconciliation. We hope that this will be the beginning of a new era where there will be more emphasis on the role of the people in the everyday politics of our country. What is important is not how many seats we have won, although of course we are extremely gratified that we have won so many, but the fact that the people are so enthusiastic about participating in the democratic process. International monitors say the polls were an encouraging step towards democracy despite some complaints of irregularities. A correspondent tells us how the by-elections are being covered by local media. Now, if you see the new light of Myanmar, this is the newspaper, um, the government-backed newspaper. It shows, um, you know, Tencent and um, his wife voting. This paper is uh, published both in English and Burmese. I have the uh, Burmese version here. It's the same. It does not show a single picture of Miss Aung San Suu Kyi, the um, Navy door times. Same pictures as well, but the only difference is that for this bottom picture here, if you see, it says NLD celebrates. Now, the other um, privately owned uh, newspaper, and that is um, the uh, Myanmar 11. Now, I couldn't even get a copy of that. It was all sold out. So you get a sense of excitement, euphemism, but also with a tinge of caution. So I am really satisfied. I'm sure one day, if she can lead our country, many things will, many things will have changes. But in the previous time, if we stand and talk like this, we will have to go to somewhere. So, but now you can talk freely, you can, you can shoot freely, you can express what you want. We like you, we don't like you. Now we can, you can elect. And in another sign that it's opening up, Myanmar launched a new currency regime today. The managed flotation of its currency, the chat, is the government's most radical economic reform yet. Analysts say the simplified regime will facilitate trade and investment. ASEAN foreign ministers have congratulated Myanmar on the conduct of its by-elections. They are in Cambodia ahead of the ASEAN Leaders' Summit, which opens tomorrow. It's a positive development in Myanmar. That's the view of ASEAN foreign ministers meeting in Phnom Penh. We all have observers on the ground, and uh, our observers feed back to us. And uh, news reports also suggest that the process of uh, how the by-elections have been held is uh, generally acceptable. A delegation of observers sent by the ASEAN chair has also reported that Myanmar's elections were conducted in a free, fair and transparent manner. The group also urged the international community to consider lifting economic sanctions on Myanmar. The European Union says any reaction from its Foreign Affairs Council will depend on the results. I would say that if the elections are free and fair, then one can expect that uh, uh, the Foreign Affairs Council uh, will make a move what exactly the move will be, that's up to them. Another issue and a more pressing one for ASEAN is to achieve the vision of an economic community by 2015. Singapore's foreign minister says ASEAN's economic agencies have been going on roadshows to different countries to push the proposals and a major roadshow is now being planned for Japan. Plans to hasten connectivity projects for ASEAN's economic community vision will be spelt out in the Phnom Penh Declaration to be issued at the end of the Leaders' Summit. As Ramesh Channel News Asia in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And Prime Minister Lee Hsien Lung has arrived in Phnom Penh for the 20th ASEAN Summit. He joined his counterparts tonight at a dinner hosted by Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen. And still to come on five, a revised management report card for Singapore town councils. They have to account for even more of their practices. And outrage in Britain over the government's plans to snoop on everyone's phone and internet activities.
Welcome back. A former engineer who was fired by Singtel is being jailed for 15 months over what he did in revenge. Terence Tan Kun Shan cut fibre optic cables belonging to OpenNet, the consortium that's setting up Singapore's ultra-fast broadband network. Singtel is one of four companies in OpenNet. Tan cut the cables in various places on more than 600 occasions. He wanted to sabotage his supervisors after being sacked. Police say five people, men and women, are helping with investigations into online postings and SMSs about children being kidnapped. And here are some examples. Seven such cases were reported between 19th and 31st of March. None turned out to be true. Police say there's no evidence of criminal intent. But transmitting false messages is an offence, and anyone found guilty could be jailed for three years and fined. Town councils will be subjected to greater accountability under a revised management report card. They'll be assessed in two new areas, corporate governance and financial adequacy. There's also more emphasis on lapses which pose health or safety concerns. The half-yearly Town Council Management Report, first introduced in 2009, tracks their performances to keep residents informed. These will now be based on six indicators. Financial adequacy is one new area. While Town Councils will have to provide information if they have enough funds to meet future expenses, especially for big-ticket items such as repainting, repairs and lift replacements, now the move is expected to help residents to better understand if their Town Councils have enough funds to deliver such services on a sustainable basis through the service and conservancy charges collected from them. Corporate governance is another. All 15 town councils must submit a self-declared checklist on their compliance to the Town Councils Act and financial rules. Especially for newer staff no, who may not be familiar, so such checklists will be indeed uh, useful training and also guide for them. We will instill greater confidence in our residents because not many residents fully understand how the town councils uh, are run. Observers say the move will promote greater transparency. Having the checklist will enable the public to quickly assess how the town councils are doing in terms of requirements of the Town Councils Act. This will create uh, pressure on town councils because this is going to be quite public. The other existing four indicators have also been tweaked. The report will now consider severity of observations in cleanliness and maintenance. For example, they will be rated more poorly for failing to replace a missing manhole cover over a light fixture. Minister of State Li Yixian, who led the review, said a key objective was to make the report easier for residents to understand. A town council's performance in each category will now be presented in green, amber or red, with green reflecting good performance instead of between levels 1 and 5 previously. The report under the revised framework will be published and this year. The Singapore Armed Forces has set up a new grouping to enhance its knowledge sharing capabilities. And this marks another milestone in transforming the military into a third generation fighting force. Command, control, communications, computers and intelligence or C4I. It may be a mouthful, but in military speak, it refers to networks used by these men to understand and act decisively during battles. In a complex military operation, the combined might of the Army, Navy and Air Force are often called upon, and the better the branches can talk to each other, the higher the odds of winning the battle. Therefore, Singapore has brought its C4I capabilities across the military into one community. The immediate priority is clearly to take care of the people. Uh, they have grouped them together and we are going to actually work very much on human capital development uh, to train them, uh, to create opportunities for them uh, and to look at their careers. These large and strategic investments in integrating our command and control systems and processes play to our strengths as our people possess technological expertise. It also mitigates our weaknesses in multiplying our limited manpower and providing early warning. With the grouping, Singapore is believed to be among the first in the world to integrate C4I in this manner. 
Elsewhere, the British government is under fire over its plans to monitor all phone calls, SMSs, email exchanges and online activities in the country. Rights groups are calling this an unprecedented, drastic step in a democracy. And there's criticism even from within the ranks of the ruling Conservative Party. Under the proposed new law, internet companies will have to install hardware that would let the government access communications data on demand and in real time. The Interior Ministry says this is necessary so that it can investigate serious crimes and terrorism. The new law won't let authorities snoop on content unless they have a warrant, but they can check who's in touch with who, how frequently and for how long. Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak is marking his third year in office with improved approval ratings. And many agree that the Najib factor will be important in the coming general election. He has been telling the nation about his achievements tonight in a televised speech. A Malaysia bureau chief has more. Well, on the eve of his uh, third anniversary in office, Mr. Najib dished out a report card for his own administration that exceeded all expectations, he said, under the government transformation program. The government, he said, has helped to cushion the rising cost of living for the people, including a one-off uh, cash handout to some four million households, um, and also cash aid to students. And for the first time, primary and secondary ed education is now free for all Malaysians. Our crime rate, he said, was reduced significantly in the last years. Uh, street crime especially, has, was down by 40%. Now, the government, he said, is committed to fighting corruption as well, offering not just small fries, but also the big fish. Now, under the economic transformation program, on the other hand, Malaysia, he said, has exceeded its target with more than 13% increase in uh, FDI last year, and has created more than 310,000 jobs. That will, you know, happen in 2020. Now, under his stewardship, he said Malaysia is on course to become a high-income nation with per capita income of 15,000 US dollars by 2020. So he urged the Malaysia not to experiment by changing drivers halfway. He said, he said he described the opposition as dangerous and careless drivers, adding that they are only good at making empty promises, adding that the government is responsible. And he also trusts the people who choose wisely when the time comes, um, you know, and continue to place a trust with the BNN government. North Korea has announced that its ruling party will hold a special conference on the 11th of April. It's expected to wrap up a transfer of power to Kim Jong-un. So far, Mr. Kim has been formally appointed to only one of his late father's posts, that of Supreme Commander of the military. Next week's meeting is likely to happen just days before a controversial rocket launch. Meantime, reports say North Korea has cut its minimum height requirement for military conscripts because of the effects of a devastating famine in the 1990s. Growth was stunted among the generation now facing a call-up. So the minimum height is now 142 centimetres. That's 4 feet 9 inches, down from 145 centimetres. Sports News is just ahead with more reaction to Singapore's silver showing at the World Table Tennis Championships last night. Plus, when a bride being taken for a ride turns out to be a good thing. I'll explain right after this. In business news, DBS is set to become the fifth largest lender in Indonesia. It's paying $9.1 billion to acquire Bank Danamon. A unit of Tomasic Holdings called Fullerton Financial will get $6.2 billion in new shares for its 67% stake. After the deal, Tomasic's stake in DBS will rise to around 40%. The taxman is simplifying tax filing for small companies to help them cut compliance costs. Currently, all firms must report their estimated chargeable income within three months of the end of their financial year. Now, this will be waived for small companies with turnover not exceeding $1 million and no chargeable income. And here are the market numbers. Singapore's women's table tennis team may have lost their world title to China, but the Singapore Table Tennis Federation is still pleased, saying the women's and men's teams exceeded their overall targets. The men finished 8th at the World Championships in Germany compared to 16th in 2010, and they qualified to play in a World Cup for the first time. The STTA says that's a credible showing. 
The women's defense of their title was always acknowledged to be an uphill task, but the competition has helped with their Olympic preparations, where they are targeting two medals. The entire squad returns home at 2 p.m. tomorrow at Changi Airport Terminal 1. And Singapore's plans to compete in the 2014 Winter Olympics have got a boost with the opening of the country's first Olympic-sized skating rink. The 60 by 30 meter rink was opened with performances by the various disciplines under ice skating. From figure skating to ice hockey to something that could put Singapore on the world map, short track speed skating. It's good news for Lucas Ng, Singapore's only representative at the 2011 Asian Winter Games. I will definitely work harder and train harder and to go for more competitions to get myself more experience before I go for the big games. An Olympic-sized rink also ensures the Singapore Ice Skating Association's continued membership with the International Skating Union. CESA wants to use the rink to grow the sport here. Well, we've been asked to host the Asian Short Track Trophy in Singapore. So uh, once the padding is in place, we will host that competition, hopefully mid-year. Ice hockey with its thriving league is another sport that has big plans. The facility located at the J-Cube Mall in Jurong East is set to bring the sport closer to the community. Admission charges are $14 for adults, but if you include the rental of boots, gloves and socks, it comes up to $21.50 and it's $2 cheaper for the entire package for kids below 12 years old. Now, another unique feature of this ring is it offers Singapore's first ringside dining experience. Last but not least, asking someone to marry you can be a nerve-wracking affair. More so if you are doing it on the world's steepest roller coaster. One Japanese couple went up in a ride at the base of Mount Fuji to take the plunge. In fact, Takumi and Azumi have already had a taste of the real life ups and downs of marriage. They tied the knot last year, though Takumi had never proposed, but he's made up for it now. If you want to do it too, you can. It's part of the Fuji Q Highland Amusement Park's new wedding package. And this has been News 5 tonight. Good night.